thanks so much for joining us this weekend. A lot of effort has gone into planning this conference and we're excited to get started. Our first talk today is with Michael Saylor, an entrepreneur and business executive who co-founded and leads MicroStrategy, a company that provides business intelligence, mobile software, and cloud-based services. In July of 2020, Michael announced his intention for MicroStrategy to purchase Bitcoin. His company bought $250 million worth of Bitcoin in August of that year. To date, MicroStrategy has purchased a total of $3.97 billion worth of Bitcoin, and Michael has become one of the most prominent and articulate proponents of Bitcoin in the world. Michael is a graduate of MIT, and we are very fortunate to have him with us here today. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. One of the reasons we're so excited to have you speak is because you do such a good job of putting the topics we're discussing into a much uh, larger historical and macro context. There are a number of useful analogies that I've heard you use to do this, but where I want to start today is your explanation of Bitcoin as digital energy. Can you explain this concept and why it is important? I think that uh, when you look at the, the fundamental breakthroughs with Bitcoin, one of them is solving the double spend problem. And the second is solving the problem of how you transfer a Bitcoin without a trusted intermediary, without a trusted third party. So oftentimes those things are used in context of an asset or a currency. But if you think more deeply about this, solving the double spend problem is the same as solving the problem of conservation of energy in the universe. If I, if I take a block of, of uh, a million pounds of gold and I, and I transfer it to myself, to yourself, there's still only a million pounds of gold. And, um, and when you think about the, solving the problem of doing this without a trusted third party, that's the same as making it possible to transfer a, a bearer instrument or transfer anything in the universe. So, so if you don't solve the problem of a trusted third party, then you've just created a simulation you, you know, I'm transferring a million coupons from me to you, and we have a bank somewhere else or another file that's actually keeping the true representation uh, relevant. So now let's, let's think about that a bit. Um, if I have an MP4 file, and I gave you an MP4 file, I've created digital information. It's actually a digital video. It's music, and it's, uh, and it's image. Now, if you take the MP4 file and you send it to your friend in Tokyo and they actually have a computer, they can decode the file. And if they can, run, if they can plug that into electricity and then put that into um, a, a speaker, they can play the file or they put it into a screen and they can view the file. So I have sent you digital entertainment. If I take away the electricity and the computer and the speaker, it's not digital music in Tokyo. But the file itself is a bearer instrument. If I were to send you just a, a hash or, or some kind of key to a central server with music on it, I haven't sent you digital music. I've sent you the rights to access somebody else's digital music. But when I encode the entire Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in an MP4 file, I have sent you digital music. Now that is digital information. Right. Uh, it only exists in the context of the human race if there's electricity and there's computers and there's speakers in Tokyo. If you if you obliterate all the people in Japan, is it still digital music? Well, yeah, it's still a digital music file. And so once we start thinking about that now, now the question is, is it digital energy? If I send you Beethoven's Fifth Symphony to your file in, in Tokyo, can you buy a building with it? And the answer is no, you cannot buy a building with, a, with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in an MP4 file. Why can't you? Well, because it's non-conservative, because there's a billion other people that also have the same MP4 file, or I could stamp out the MP4 file over and over and over again. And therefore, if I can just send you Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in an MP4 file, and you could buy a building, right? That violates the laws of physics and it blows up the universe, right? Pretty soon the cost of a building would go up by a factor of a million because everybody in Tokyo would want to buy the building with the MP4 file. And what do we call that? Inflation, right? Whenever you have something that's non-conservative in the universe, you get infl inflation. But 
the entire last 30 years of the internet is all about uh, digital transformation of information and digital maps and digital music and digital entertainment. These are all examples of non-conservative bearer instruments moving through cyberspace. What do you get? Well, you get an explosion of information, an explosion of entertainment, an explosion of education, all good things, but they are not energy because they are not conservative. What's, what, what is the difference between that and a file that holds your private keys to a billion dollars of Bitcoin? If I send you my private keys to a billion dollars of Bitcoin, you can indeed buy an entire city block or a building in Tokyo, and I can't. Right, so it was a, it was a transfer of energy from me to you. Now, some people say, well, it's not really energy because blah blah blah, you can't turn into electricity. But they missed the point. The point is, I sent you the file with. Would you, first of all, would you want the file with the billion dollars of Bitcoin in it if I offered to send it to you? Presumably, right? So uh, it's pretty clear it's different qualitatively than an MP4 file that plays Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Um, and, uh, and so I send you that. Now, how do you turn it into, back into energy? Well, what, a lot of times people don't understand what energy is, right? Energy is electricity or it's sound or it's a block of granite or it's metal or it's glass. It's all matter, everything in the universe is energy, right? And matter can be converted to energy. Energy can be converted into matter. Tesla said, if you want to understand the secret to the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And it's not something we think about very deeply until you have to, but for the first time in, in the world of the internet, in the world of technology and cyberspace, you have to start thinking about vibration and energy and frequency, right? That's the significance of Bitcoin. So I'm gonna send that, that file to you in Tokyo. Now, how do you convert it into a building? Well, it, it's digital energy. You're going to convert it into political energy by running it through an exchange. You're going to sell the Bitcoin for yen. And political energy is just another fluid. It's, a, it's, a, it's another medium, in this case, the currency. And then I'm going to take the currency. I'm going to buy the building. And if I don't want the building, I'm going to buy a, a tanker with oil in it. Or if I don't want that, I'm going to actually pay a million people to work for me for an hour. Right? I'm going to convert it into work. I'm going to convert it into property. I'm going to convert it into matter. I'm going to convert it into any form of energy, into natural gas, whatever I want. And the, and the exchange is, it's like a heat exchange. I take, I take the digital energy, I make it political energy, then I make it matter, or I make it property, or I make it work. And um, you could say, well, you know, if you take away the Bitcoin exchange, it's not energy anymore. Well, that's kind of like saying if you took away the speaker, is that a digital music file anymore? It's still a digital music file, right? And, and of course, it's kind of ridiculous because if it's, a, if it's a digital music file with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and you want to listen to it, you'll probably find yourself a speaker and a computer to run it through because you want what's in the file. You want to decode the file. And if I gave you a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin in a file, you would probably travel somewhere in the world and find an exchange or a person. Even if there was no exchange, you would go find someone that owned a building and you would just swap them the Bitcoin for the building directly in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. So, so Bitcoin is digital energy because it is non-conservative and because it can get work done, just like energy can get work done. And also because it can be converted into matter or property. Now, um, let's think a little bit about Think about uh, this concept of Bitcoin, right? The simplest metaphor is it's digital gold. Well, let's think about what is gold? What is property? What is money? What is capital? What is energy? Okay, well, gold, it, gold is a property and property is low frequency money. If I take a billion dollars and I put it in a, a bunch of gold, it sits sometimes in the same vault for 30 years very low frequency. If I put it, it's kind of low maintenance, low frequency. If I put it into a building, it sits in the same place for 30 years. It's high maintenance, low frequency money. If I actually put it in currency like the yen, it's mid frequency. Uh, it's, it's mid frequency, uh, you know, money in this particular case. Now, um, Currency is a way that money moves through a medium, and some currencies will hold, uh, hold the energy very well, a strong currency, 
Bitcoin is a strong currency if it's used as a currency, but maybe the US, is, the US dollar is a stronger currency. The yen is a weaker currency. It's lost 14% of its value in the past few weeks. The peso is a weaker currency. The bolivar is a really weak currency. So you have weak currencies, you have strong currencies. And when we call them weak or strong, it's really, uh, it's really kind of a, it's an articulation of the coefficient of energy loss or the coefficient of the adiabatic lapse, the energy lapse in the fluid as the energy moves through it. And when you understand money like that, then you understand the currencies are just fluids through which monetary money or monetary energy can flow. Money is economic energy. What is capital? Right? Ca capital is the concept of pure economic energy. So if I give you a billion dollars of capital, right, and you want to hold it for 100 years, how do you maintain the capital? Well, if you put it in a weak currency, it goes away. You put it in a strong property, it actually accretes or holds its value. So what is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin's digital gold, but it's also digital property. It's also digital money. It's also digital capital. It's also digital energy. Think in terms of frequency, right? That's what Tesla told us to think. Low frequency, it's property. High frequency, it's energy. Now, what's the difference between money and energy? And what's the difference between, well, money is monetary energy, right? Properly understood. When we, use, when we use money and currency interchangeably, we're kind of sloppy and we need to get much tighter. Currency is just is political energy, right? It's, a, it's a generally fiat currency, it's political energy. It's a medium to move the monetary energy through. But what we normally think of as money, we oftentimes, you know, the only thing we remember is currency like coins or fiat currency. So let's think a little bit about the difference between currency and energy. Currency is uh, mid-frequency and discrete money, whereas digital energy, pure energy, could be high frequency and continuous, or it could be mid-frequency and, uh, and discrete, or it could be low frequency and discrete, right? Energy is anything, right? The universe is composed of energy. And now here's where we get to, where we get to what I think is the real big breakthrough. Once you get your head around the idea that Bitcoin is digital energy and it could vibrate and oscillate at all frequencies and, and it could be transformed. What, what is vibration? Vibration is, is converting your kinetic energy uh, to potential energy or converting one form of energy to another form of energy, right? Uh, once you understand that, and then you think we've got a way to put energy in cyberspace, now an entire world of possibilities open up. For example, um, if Bitcoin is digital energy, then I can create radiation in cyberspace. So for example, the sun shines upon you. What does that mean? And music to your ears. What does that mean? Music to your ears is, is, is acoustic energy flowing through the room to make you happy. But, and, and you can harm somebody with acoustic energy. I can create a directed acoustic energy weapon and blow out your eardrums, right? Uh, sun shining on your face, it could, is it bright sunshine or is it mild sunshine or are you in the dark? Well, if, if you want to kill the planet, you turn off the sun, right? So if I put sunshine on the planet, I light up the planet, it's energy. And eventually the energy could be uh, converted by photosynthesis into life, right? So, and you know, eventually you end up with things like coal and you have oil and you have everything that we live off of. Okay, so what is the equivalent of radiation in cyberspace? It's you come to my website and you have uh, a lightning wallet and, and I have uh, a lightning um, source or a, a Satoshi source. And every second you spend on my website, I send you one Satoshi. That's a very light sunshine. What if I sent you a hundred Satoshis, brighter sunshine? What if I sent you a million Satoshis a second? Would you bask in the glow, right, uh, of, of my radiation, right? In that particular case, you're going to get very powerful. I mean, think about standing underneath a million Satoshis a second. Now, here's the interesting thing. Like, if I told you I had a website where you could receive a million Satoshis a second, would you show up? If I told you I'd pay you a million Satoshis a second to listen to my mouth move, my lips move, would you listen? Very interesting, right? Now, if I want your attention, I shine the light 
right, in cyberspace. No one ever thought to do that with currency, but the, the closest equivalent would be I shower money on your head, right? I drop coins on your head. I throw pennies at you. But it's not very practical to throw pennies at people. And, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't work. It's very practical to actually radiate Satoshis at people. And if we, if we follow this a little bit further, now the question is, if radiation is sending my Satoshis in your direction, what's gravity, right? Can I actually create gravity, right? This is, this is a very interesting thing. You have Satoshis, right? And, uh, and you wanna come into my orbit, Right, and we can start to do an exchange where, where um, well, I guess here's an interesting observation. You have 20,000 Satoshis and then uh, every minute you lose one Satoshi. And when you get to zero, you get kicked out of cyberspace. You get kicked out of my web or my mobile app. That's like flying an airplane at 20,000 feet. And when an airplane's at 20,000 feet, it has more energy. Right? It has potential energy. You can use that energy to speed up. When you run out of 20,000 feet, you crater into the dirt and you crash and burn. It's the problem. So what if I actually start to, to model your interchange through my, uh, through my uh, cyber system by taking your potential energy and, and, and or, or giving you uh, kinetic energy in return for it? If you actually deposit you deposit 20,000 Satoshis with me and I give you speed and velocity through my website. We come back to Twitter, right? You want to post a comment, you have to actually deposit 10,000 Satoshis to post a comment. You want to post a million comments, you have to post a million times 10,000 Satoshis. There's a cost for kinetic energy and that is the potential energy. I'm actually vibrating I'm, and I'm changing your energy situation. Um, you know, what is orbit, right? Like, what if I gave you a million Satoshi loan, but you had to give it back to me in a year? Yeah, that's very, you know, I can get you to orbit, right? A bank is a solar, is an astronomical body. I can get you to orbit around my, uh, my cyber body by exchanging Satoshis with you through a smart contract. And, um, and I can vibrate and I can create all sorts of forms of energy. Like one form of energy is the ability to send messages on Twitter. Another form of energy is the ability to talk to people on YouTube. You want to give me a hundred million Satoshis, maybe I will give you the bandwidth of 10 million people on YouTube, right? I will exchange one form of energy for another form of energy, right? Maybe, maybe you can create a way to slingshot around my son, right? And, and I can, I can uh, create competing uh, ideas. Now, Let's back off and say, well, what is the significance of all that? If you understand Bitcoin is digital energy and you can see high frequency vibration or high frequency exchange, you can create an entirely new class of applications using lightning, right? Uh, like uh, you could create cybersecurity applications. You create lightning badges that will allow you to cross cyber domains. Uh, you can create uh, marketing applications that actually reward people with streaming sats for their attention. You can create uh, any kind of high frequency interactions. You know, they say you, you can't die in cyberspace. Well, you, you kind of, you can't die in cyberspace except through proxy right now, because yeah, everything is really, um, is really based on a trusted third party or a counterparty. And they're the one that decide like Visa or credit card network, they decide whether you, you ran out of money and they kick you out or they come kick on, they knock on your door and they arrest you because you can't pay your bill, right? So cyberspace is really a simulation right now. But if we actually throw away the Visa network and the banks, and we just substitute a lightning wallet on one side and a lightning wall or a lightning, a lightning source on the other side or lightning bank, then you can literally move anywhere at the speed of light. You can move through a, a thousand websites in 10 milliseconds each. You can exchange energy and, and, um, and you can receive energy for your action. You can, uh, you can create or, or duplicate gravity. You can also duplicate friction. Right, you can, also do, you can also create the speed of sound. You can create limits. For example, how fast should you be able to move through Twitter or through uh, YouTube? 
right? At, at the point where, you know, this morning I post a tweet and I had six comments within one second. They weren't real people. They were bots, right? So, so in a world without friction and a world without consequences, I can uh, send a million bots to a million places and smash them up anonymously in order to corrupt cyberspace. But what, what we have now with Bitcoin, once you properly understand it, once you, once you see that it is truly a block of energy, it's, it's moving at low frequency on the base layer, but it moves extremely high frequency on a layer two or a layer three. I would say if you're a technologist today and you're thinking about creating the next great thing, you ought to be thinking about how you create applications of digital energy for security or for, uh, for beauty, right? You can create something that is, you, you can make Twitter a, a thousand times better, more beautiful. You can create economic applications. Right? You pay me money when you send me a message. You can create marketing applications. I will shine Satoshi's on you by listening to me okay it, you can create can you how do you create a wall in cyberspace let's think about how you create a wall in real space i create a wall and it's plywood or maybe a, a wall which is drywall you can smash right through a drywall because there's not a lot of energy in drywall if you create a wall which is made of steel one inch thick and you run as hard as you can at it right you damage yourself so creating a wall in the real world requires you use more energy what if I create a wall of Satoshis in cyberspace? Or in this particular case, I create an application. And when you show up to the application, you have to post a million Satoshis. And then every time you, you break my rule, like maybe you, maybe you post a, a swear word or you post a phishing attack in a comment, I charge you the million Satoshis. It's like literally pounding your, you know, it's like you pounding your face into a, a brick wall or into a steel wall. I can create a wall in cyberspace around a product if I have digital energy and I can do it without requiring a trusted third party, right? The, the, the trusted third party, the doxing is what makes cyberspace not work because we go from 8 billion people being able to interact in milliseconds and, and including computers on our behalf to a situation where, you know, I have to post a credit card and half the world doesn't have a credit card. And then I got to wait 30 to 60 days for final settlement of the credit card. And so, you know, how do you run up a hundred million dollar bill in eight seconds? Like in, in the real world, if I light up a bonfire and you walk into the bonfire, you will burn to death. Right. But in the cyber world, you can't burn to death. Right. There is no equivalent to that because the credit card companies not they're going to decay the deal. If you actually went on Twitter, launched a million bot attacks to cost you ten dollars each and generate a hundred million dollar bill. Right. The credit card would fail. And so you, you can't really create things with true consequence because the, the world is running on the equivalent of rubber band and bailing wire, you know, sim, you know, simulated proxies of energy. So I, I will stop right there, right? That, that is in a nutshell though, why I'm very interested and excited about Bitcoin as digital energy. Awesome, thank you. And I'm curious why, um, why did MicroStrategy or, or you choose to purchase Bitcoin back in 2020? And how has that evolved since then? Um, and, and why have you chosen to focus on only Bitcoin and not other cryptocurrencies? So capital is energy. We had $500 million of treasury capital. If you store your, your, uh, your energy in uh, pesos, that $500 million would become worth about $5 million. Right, like I, I made a joke the other day, Lex Friedman said, I, I picked up $20 off the street and I said, $20 doesn't buy what seven cents used to. And the joke was that the, the value of $20 has decayed by 97, 99.7% in 90 years, 99.7%. That's, that's the loss of true energy in the currency. So if you're holding uh, your capital or your, your life force or energy as a company in a currency or currency derivative, and that means dollars or US sovereign debt, the, current, the monetary and 
inflation rate, or which is the adiabatic wrap, lapse rate, which is the risk-free rate, which is the cost of capital, is like 15 to 20%. And in March of 2020, what we saw was the cost of capital went to 25%. Everything got 25% more, more expensive in 12 months. Now, what is everything? Well, scarce desirable products. The S&P index went up 25% in, in uh, 12 months. So you had an expansion of the currency, right? Expansion of the currency results in a collapse in the energy per unit of currency. This is the same as if I expanded the size of your room by a factor of, of two, but I kept the oxygen or the air in it the same, the temperature would fall, right? That's how an air conditioner or a refrigerator works. I would freeze you to death. So what we saw in March was the currency expanding. We're sitting on a block of $500 million and you can do the math in your head and you can conclude that half the energy or half the wealth you have will be gone in about 36 months, maybe 48 to 36. So it, you know, why did we convert uh, to Bitcoin? Well, for the same reason that if I, if I told you I was sucking the oxygen out of the room you're in right now, and I'm going to suck 20% of the oxygen out of the room, you know, every period for the next four periods, you would reach for an oxygen mask, mask or you would run out of the room. And if you were stupid, you'd stay in the room, but you would suffocate or you'd freeze to death. So every company in the world that's sitting on a treasury, if you had a billion dollars right now in US sovereign debt, it's costing you somewhere in the order of 150 to $200 million a year to hold that position. The smart thing to do, like if you're conventional, what you do is you give all the money back to the shareholders and you borrow a billion and you run on zero net working capital or you even run on minus, like I borrowed $2 billion and I have minus $1 billion in currency. So if I can get heavily indebted, I have negative working capital. So instead of it costing me 200 million a year to keep the money, I make 200 million a year because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm leeching off of the general public. I'm, I'm basically taking advantage of my ability to borrow money from a central bank or a bank in order to get short or, or have a negative effective uh, working capital balance. Now, where do you see that? Japan. In Japan, whenever you see a zombie company that is loaded up with debt, what the company did is they basically converted all of their positive capital into negative working capital. So perversely, if I owe $10 billion and if the money supply or the currency supply expands at 15% a year, and if I pay 3% interest, I actually make $120 million a year doing nothing. See, that, that's the perversity of being able to borrow huge amounts of money. You ask yourself the question, well, how, do you, how, do I, how are you going to borrow a billion dollars of money, right? Uh, it, my, my advice is if you could, it would be a good idea, right? If you were able to borrow a billion dollars in an inflationary environment, you would get rich in a hurry just by being negative energy or negative currency. So why MicroStrategy do it? It's like, well... We were basically going to, what we realized is that if we generate $75 million of, of free cash flow a year through the work of 2,000 people working as hard as they can, and if we held $500 million of US uh, currency derivatives losing $150 million a year, then we would net negative lose $75 million a year in shareholder value working as hard as we could forever. So in essence, you're going backwards. So this is the big idea. Um, and if you look at companies, anybody is either in a negative or a positive working capital situation. When the currency is expanding at 5% a year, it's kind of a nuisance. When you go to Argentina or Turkey and it's expanding at 50% a year, it's a life or death situation. You have to be negative working capital. But now let's think about central banks, like countries. You have a country and you sell $100 billion worth of oil a year and you convert that into, into a, a treasury reserve and you hold US sovereign debt. So you've got a trillion dollars of US sovereign debt. If you hold a trillion dollars of US sovereign debt and the US inflates the currency at 15% a year, it costs your people $150 billion a year for you to use, use uh, the US currency as your treasury reserve asset you're paying $150 billion a year for, for quote unquote social security or, or economic security, right? 
So the, you have to ask yourself the question, if you have any energy in your institution, your family, works for families, works for companies, works for countries, <clears throat> you have energy, how are you going to, what, what, how are you going to store the energy? And the way you store your energy colloquial is what we'll call the treasury reserve asset. And if you choose, let's make it simple. You could choose the Bolivar, you could choose the peso, you could choose the dollar, you could choose gold, or you could choose Bitcoin. You could choose barrels of oil. They're all just different treasury reserve assets. The problem with the currencies is they're, they all have counterparty risk, right? A bank can seize them from you. But if they didn't, then you're going to have an energy lapse of 95% to 99% in the Bolivar, energy lapse of 50% in the peso, energy lapse of you know, 15% in the dollar, energy lapse of 2 to 4% in gold. You're going to have an energy accretion in Bitcoin. That's why we did what we did. It's just a simple, it started out as, um, defensive survival strategy it's like well we're just gonna we're going to freeze to death and suffocate if we don't do something so it's a survival strategy then it became um opportunistic what we realized is we could issue 650 million dollars of debt that pays one percent or less than one percent interest and we could buy bitcoin and that just seemed like a good idea, go short the dollar and go long the asset appreciating. And then it became a strategy because we realized we could issue a billion dollars of debt at 0% interest and buy Bitcoin. Right. And, and uh, you know, somewhere along the line, it went from, you know, from a, a reflex to an opportunity, to a strategy, to an ideology. Awesome, thank you. And and so with all of this um, excitement around the innovative nature of Bitcoin and all of this potential, there's still a lot of criticism. Um, what are some of the criticisms that you've heard about Bitcoin from those who don't necessarily understand it? And how do you think it can be better explained to these individuals? I think the criticism that comes from the technologists and the computer scientists and the people in the crypto industry or, or just others is, oh, it's not digital energy. It's just digital currency or it's the digital or it's maybe it's digital property. That's well understood and appreciated now. But it started out as a currency. People, I think, have embraced the fact that it's really digital property because it's low frequency money. It's not going to be a currency per se until it's legal to transfer it without a taxable event. <clears throat> and of course, the legal part is a regulation put on by a nation state. So if the nation state makes it possible to transfer it without a taxable event, it can be a currency. Until then, it's really just a property. And uh, I think we got past that hurdle for the most part. Now people go, well, it's not energy. <laughs> it's not energy because you can't convert it into electricity. Well, I, you know, and I think that that that's a crippling, uh, a crippling ignorance on the part of a lot of people, because if you don't understand that it's digital energy, then there's like a hundred trillion dollars worth of applications you're not going to get. <laughs> you're locking yourself out of the 21st century cyber economy, you know, if you don't grasp that. And I, I would say, right, that the most powerful ideas of paradigm shifts uh, Warren Buffett doesn't understand that Bitcoin is digital property, right? He, the last week he said, well, you know, I, you know, I can get yield, I can rent out farmland and I can rent out a building, but I can't rent out Bitcoin. He's like, well, totally wrong. Of course you can rent out Bitcoin, right? In fact, Bitcoin is like farmland or a building on land, but you got rid of the land nexus and you got rid of the building maintenance cost. And now you have the pure capital, right? If you thought more theoretically, you would understand that Bitcoin is pure digital capital, which means that anywhere in the world, you can find hundreds of thousands of people that will want to rent out your capital. And so the, under, the, the lack of understanding of it as digital capital is still a problem with the mainstream investor, not so much a problem in the crypto community. But uh, when people understand it as digital property and digital capital, and you can rent it and you can mortgage it, right? Uh, then, then that'll be a light bulb moment for many people. And then I think on the other extreme, when they understand it's digital energy, they'll start to think about 
creating applications with gravity and friction and radiation and orbital mechanics in cyberspace. And now we can actually create things of substance in cyberspace. I can, you know, I can actually create something that's got tangible matter in cyberspace that will be drawn into your orbit, that will be fueled by your energy, that can either be created or destroyed by your energy. And, and that opens up the next era of, of the internet, right? And so I think that's really critical. Now, we'll move on to some third party uh, FUD. There's a lot of energy FUD that floats around. So, I mean, one, one misnomer, you know, this, this floats with some people is, oh, Bitcoin uses either too much energy or it's bad for the environment, right? These are based on first order ignorance, generally. Um, if you if you thought about it, and the reason that the reason people think this is is they start with one uh, one crippling mistake. They think that somehow uh, you can create a digital property or digital energy without energy. That's the, that's the crippling mistake. That that's confusing um, a building in the real world for a building in cyberspace or or a a virtual building. I. Can, can give you a virtual building, a virtual plane, a virtual train, virtual medical care, and virtual food in my little happy virtual world, and they don't take any energy, but they're not the same as real medicine, real food, real planes, real cars, real trains in the real world. So when people think that uh, a token circulating on like a proof of stake network or a token circulating in a central database is the same as Bitcoin, they just equate uh, virtual with real and they, and they conflate the two. So if you understood them technically, if you have really thought about the engineering, you'd understand that, uh, that there's like $20 billion worth of hardware, Bitcoin miners, SHA-256 rigs and energy from, from all sources going into securing and, and, uh, and driving the Bitcoin network. And of course, if you take away all that, all you've got is the simulation of it. And there's of course, 20,000 simulations. In fact, you can create, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of digital coupons and digital securities and, uh, and, and virtual uh, currencies that circulate on non-energy networks. The problem is they're not scarce. But the other problem is they're not open, they're not permissionless, which means they're securities, they're not property. And they're not bearer instruments, but rather they're counterparty obligations, right? They're not money, they're credit. So you can create infinite credit without energy, but you can't create money without energy. So, uh, so that, that's uh, poorly understood. Most people in the crypto industry don't understand securities law, but you don't, it, it's, not, it's not necessary to understand securities law to understand the basic idea that if it takes $20 billion of semiconductors and electricity to create something unique, that's more scarce and that's harder to attack, right? That's more, that, that's more secure and that's more tangible than if I create, uh, take a simple computer in my basement and I simulate all that stuff in a computer program. That's just a, pro that's just a computer program. So a lot of times people, they get that wrong and, and once you acknowledge that you need energy to create something real in the real world, then you just compare Bitcoin to the right thing, which is you have to compare it to planes and trains and automobiles and medicine and uh, retail and defense and the, the rest. And now you come to a very simple conclusion, which is Bitcoin is the cleanest, most efficient, most valuable use of energy in the world. Full stop, right? That, that's the big idea. You, you're putting electricity into a data center and the product is digital energy. There is no cleaner product coming out of a data center than digital energy. It is immortal, indestructible energy, right? That's a cleaner product than a Netflix streaming video. It's a cleaner product than iPhones and iPads. It's a cleaner product than, I put the energy into a laundromat or into a natural gas facility or into a plastics refinery, or I put the energy into a hospital or a school or a building. All of those things are dirtier 
applications of energy than a Bitcoin mining center. So once you get that idea, it's it's actually not it's not energy intensive. It's actually energy efficient two bit network that's worth eight hundred billion dollars. There is no example of anything in the world that you can put two billion dollars of electricity into and get an eight hundred billion dollar market cap out of other than Bitcoin. So, so that's a, a big misnomer. People don't understand digital energy. They don't understand digital capital. They don't understand digital property. They don't realize that ethically and technically, you can't succeed without putting energy into it. Right? In this particular case, not just pure energy. It's not pure electricity, right? Bitcoin's built by an encrypted form of electricity or encrypted energy, or in this particular case, it's SHA-256 hashes through a semiconductor rig fed with electricity. And that's significant too, because if it was pure energy, it would be a pure commodity. But in fact, because it's digital energy and a form of digital energy, SHA-256 digital energy, that means that uh, there's Moore's law that's applying and there's a, there's a learning curve. And of course the efficiency with which we create that digital energy is increasing eh, about 18% to 36% a year, right? The, the current mining rigs are 58 times more efficient than they were about eight years ago. So what you have here is, um, is a flavor of digital energy uh, being created by electricity. And we can't, we, we don't know any other way to do it. It's, it's, I, I wouldn't say that it's impossible to come up with another way to do it. Someone may come up with a more energy efficient way than SHA-256 proof of work hashes, maybe, but no one's done it yet, right? No one, and, and no one has managed to create a digital property uh, that doesn't use some sort of uh, proof of work function. So I, I think that, um, that, that uh, most of the ESG FUD is actually guerrilla marketing from competing crypto networks that are, that are struggling uh, to be viable. And generally they struggle with this problem, which is if you don't use energy, <coughs> if you don't use energy, then um, it's a security. And if it's a security, you can't sell it to the general public without a registration statement and without full disclosures. It's just like an equity stock. So I, those are my thoughts on that. So last question, we've got, I think, just two minutes here. Um, this, this space is growing quickly. There's a, a lot of innovative products. Uh, what role do you think Bitcoin will play in this evolving landscape? Uh, the landscape meaning uh, the overall the economy or the crypto economy? Yeah, the crypto economy. Bitcoin is the technical, ethical foundation of the entire crypto economy because because it, it is a crypto asset network that is property that is open that's permissionless and it, it it represents a bearer instrument of energy that could be exchanged uh in time and space right so i mean the critical issue is eight billion people need to be able to do billions of transactions an hour uh with uh, represented by 20 billion or 50 billion computers, right? At the speed of light. And so to do that, you have to have first, um, you have to have the asset, right? And Bitcoin is the bearer asset. Then you need, uh, you know, then you need a transaction network. I think lightning is, is most the most likely candidate, seems like the candidate for the open permissionless transaction network. So. So Bitcoin and Lightning look like the foundation. Bitcoin, Bitcoin's role is for you to put the block of energy into the network and for it to be there in a hundred years or a thousand years, right? You just you need a foundation. I think think of it as the granite or the schist underlying Manhattan. The 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 bedrock of Manhattan is four hundred million years old. You don't need it to move. You just need it to not move. In fact, in fact, if I came to you with the idea that that I needed to, I'm God, and I'm gonna modify the schist under Manhattan, and I'm gonna make it much lighter and see-through so that I can build uh, windows with it, 
you say we just turn Manhattan into glass. And so I don't want to build uh, glass skyscrapers with glass beams on glass. It's, it starts to look like a glass house on sand. It could be a very bad idea. Um, Bitcoin is is the granite underpinning of the entire the entire economy. Then lightning is going to be that transaction la layer that is open permissionless protocol. And then I think you've got thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of applications. And they, they could be, they'll be corporate, they'll be proprietary. Uh, if they're open, they'll communicate with each other via lightning or they'll settle with each other on Bitcoin. <clears throat> and if they're, um, if they're not open, maybe they won't support lightning. You know, like you can create a proprietary application. MicroStrategy is a Bitcoin application. If I hold billions and billions of dollars of Bitcoin, then my stock is a Bitcoin derivative. We don't support Lightning. You can't withdraw your Bitcoin from the MSTR stock, right? You, we don't support Bitcoin. You can't withdraw Bitcoin uh, on the base layer with MicroStrategy, but MicroStrategy is resting on the foundation of digital property, that thing, which is Bitcoin. So, I, I mean, I see Bitcoin as like the sun, right? It, it is the source of all energy in the solar system, right? It, it is a source of radiation, right? It can give life to everything else. And uh, now it's just left to entrepreneurs to figure out how they're going to feed off the energy of, of that sun. And uh, you know the, the world is full of opportunity. Michael, thanks so much. This has been great. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Best wishes to everybody. Sorry I can't be there with you today. Go tech. <laughs> thanks so much.